Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my hands-on first looks review of the Fujifilm X-H2S, a high-end mirrorless camera with a new 26 megapixel stacked sensor, 40 frames per second bursts, built-in image stabilization, and 6.2K video. It's the most powerful and feature-packed APS-C camera to date, but at $24.99 or pounds, it's also the most expensive. I had a chance to try out a pre-production model at a Fujifilm press event, and in this video, I'll show you what's new and improved. I'll follow this up with an in-depth review of a final production X-H2S and link to it here when it's ready. Oh, and you may also notice the camera fitted with the new XF18-120 f4, a general purpose lens with a motorized zoom that was launched alongside it, which I've also made a short video about. But back to the main course. Announced in May 2022, the X-H2S actually becomes a joint flagship in the series, alongside the upcoming X-H2, arriving later this year. Right now, Fujifilm is being coy about how they'll differ other than their sensors. Both are new 5th generation X-Trans, but the X-H2S employs a 26 megapixel stack sensor versus a 40 megapixel back illuminated sensor for the upcoming X-H2. Now, stack sensors are designed for speed, so while the X-H2S may share the same resolution as the earlier X-Trans 4 models, it's much faster, shooting uncropped electronic bursts up to 40 frames per second, with less rolling shutter and skewing for both photos and movies, as well as support for higher video frame rates, while also squeezing 120 focus and exposure calculations per second. But stack sensors don't come cheap, and while the X-H2S does include a number of other high-end and expensive components, the sensor is a major contributing factor to that $2,500 or pound price tag. Now, to be fair, other stacked sensor cameras aren't exactly cheap either. The Olympus OM-1 costs $2,200 and has a smaller 4 3rd sensor, while full framers like the original Sony Alpha 9 start at over three grand, with newer versions like the A9 Mark II, Alpha 1 and Canon EOS R3 all costing considerably more. In short, you really have to want or need those fast bursts and reduced rolling shutters to justify the price. And that's why Fujifilm will also have the X-H2, an alternative model that's focused more on resolution. And while the price hadn't been announced at the time that I made this review, I'd expect it to be cheaper than the X-H2S. A second model would also give Fujifilm a chance to make it a more photocentric camera, although the resolution could actually support 8K video as well. Ultimately, we'll have to wait and see. But back to the X-H2S and what we know right now. As well as 40 frames per second electronic bursts, it can fire up to 15 frames per second using the mechanical shutter. The autofocus array may share the same resolution and full sensor coverage as the earlier X-Trans 4, but coupled with the new X Processor 5, it now supports more sophisticated object detection and tracking, including separate settings for humans, animals, birds, automobiles, bikes, aeroplanes, and trains. The movie capabilities also enjoy a serious upgrade over previous generations, with the sensor and processor now supporting uncropped 1080 from 24 to 120p, or uncropped 4K from 24 to 60p, Fujifilm says all of these are oversampled from 6.2K's worth of data, and like earlier models, you can also choose to film in either the 16x9 UHD or 17x9 DCI shapes. You can also record the output from the entire sensor in 6.2K resolution from 24 to 30p in the 3x2 shape at 6240x4160, and slow motion fans will also be pleased to find 4K 120 with a 1.29x crop, and 1080 240p with a 1.38 times crop, albeit both starting with less data than their oversampled frame rates that I mentioned a moment ago. As before, you can encode in H.264 or H.265 formats, although new to the X-H2S is the ability to alternatively record ProRes internally, although the higher bit rates will demand a CF Express card. Yep, that's a spoiler alert right there. Graders will appreciate the higher dynamic range of F-Log2 rated at 14 stops, and operating at a base of 1250 ISO, although the older F-Log is also still available at 640 ISO. Meanwhile, that full-size HDMI port can output RAW video in either ProRes RAW or BMW RAW formats. Like most recent cameras, the X-H2S dispenses with the old 30-minute recording limit, and if you give it enough power, it can now record 4K clips up to 4 hours long, under temperatures of 25 degrees C. 
One battery should be good for around 60 to 90 minutes of video recording, but by adding the optional battery grip, you can triple your shooting times. One of the more interesting accessories for videographers is a $199 fan unit, which screws into the back of the camera behind the screen and is powered by the camera itself. There's various options for the fan, but Fujifilm claims it allows the X-H2S to film up to 51 minutes of 4K under temperatures of 40 degrees C, when it would have overheated after just 17 minutes without the fan. Sure, it may not match a fully vented heatsink and fan solution, but it does remain a nice option for videographers without compromising the body design for those who don't need it. I mentioned the battery grip earlier, which costs $399 or pounds, and like earlier Fujifilm models, packs two extra batteries in addition to the one in the main body, thereby tripling the overall lifespan. This can be particularly useful if you're shooting in the most power-hungry boost modes with the viewfinder running at its top resolution. Fujifilm has also announced a future file transmitter grip that costs $999 and that adds Ethernet connectivity, improved Wi-Fi and more advanced wireless options in addition to the two extra batteries. The body itself measures 136 by 93 by 87 mil including the generous grip and that thins to 41 millimeters at the narrowest point and the whole thing weighs 660 grams with battery. This actually makes it a little smaller all round than the X-H1 and a tad lighter too. Design-wise, the most obvious difference from the top is a change of exposure control from the separate shutter and ISO dials on either side of the earlier X-H1's viewfinder head to a single PASM dial on the left side of the X-H2S. Fans of Fujifilm's vintage aesthetic will not be pleased, but I don't think this approach will necessarily be deployed on future versions of their classic models. And on the upside, the PASM dial sports no fewer than seven custom presets and also frees up room on the right hand side to include dedicated buttons for movie recording, ISO, white balance, as well as a custom function alongside the upper information display. As before, there's finger and thumb dials, although they no longer have the push to click function. I am pleased to report though that the AF joystick on the rear, inherited from the GFX100S, is now larger and slightly relocated, which to me makes it more comfortable than before. Interestingly, the previous dedicated front dial for manual, single or continuous autofocus has now gone, so you'll need to push the button in its place while turning a control dial to access this setting. I'm not sure that's necessarily an upgrade. What do you think? The side hinge touchscreen is fully articulated and can be flipped or twisted to almost any angle, including facing forward or back on itself for protection. The three inch panel itself has 1.62 million dots. The viewfinder enjoys a big upgrade, sporting a 5.76 million dot panel with a generous 0.8 times magnification and 60 or 120 frames per second refresh, making it larger, more detailed and smoother than the X-H1, not to mention making Canon's EOS R7 look a little basic. Note you'll only enjoy the full viewfinder resolution or refresh rate in the boost mode, which will burn through your batteries. In the grip, there's twin card slots and following Canon's R5 strategy with one for CF Express Type B and the other for UHS-2 SD cards. Now CF Express is necessary for recording internal ProRes as well as providing the deepest buffers for the burst modes. Fit a CF Express card and the X-H2S can fire off 800 uncompressed RAWs at 20 frames per second, 180 at 30 frames per second, or 140 at 40 frames per second. Ports include a 3.5mm microphone and headphone jack as well as full-size HDMI. Take that, Canon. And finally, the body has built-in sensor shift stabilization, described as providing up to seven stops of compensation. As before, there's also additional digital compensation for movies, if you like, albeit with the usual minor crop, and only up to 60p. Fujifilm also claims to have reduced the juddering effect when you pan. Now, I'm gonna be putting all of these claims to the test when I get a chance to spend some quality time with a final production model, hopefully before too long. And I'll link to that in-depth report here when it's ready. And that's all I can tell you about the X-H2S for now, although it does pose the question which sensor is going to end up filtering down through the Fujifilm X series range as those models are gradually updated. The new stack sensor is impressive, but it carries a high price tag and is only really justified by the speed demons out there. While the upcoming 40 megapixel sensor is arguably overkill for some of the lower end models. Personally, I feel the 26 megapixel resolution of X-Trans 4 is already sufficient for most of us. And what future versions of say the XT and X-Pro series would actually most benefit from are the autofocus improvements. 
Maybe we'll see the old X-Trans 4 paired with the new X-Processor 5. And while it wouldn't match the speed of the XH2S and all of its AF and AE calculations, it should still equip them with its advanced subject detection and tracking. And I think that would be a worthy upgrade. I'd love to hear what you think about this and the XH2S in the comments. It may have the dream specification for a truly ultimate APS-C camera, but it also carries a price tag to match. It's certainly interesting to compare Fujifilm's approach to Canon's recently announced EOS R7, which many Canon fans wished also had a stack sensor, a higher resolution viewfinder, and a faster CF Express slot. But Fujifilm has clearly illustrated how much more that would have cost. Ultimately, how much are you willing to pay for this kind of specification? Which leads me to say, as always, there are links in the description to check the latest prices, as well as one for a cheeky coffee donation for me if you find any of my reviews extra useful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.